Good morning, everyone. I hope you're well. Before I begin, I feel it only right to acknowledge the collective sadness those who knew Carly are feeling at the moment. I'd just like to do a short prayer. Father in heaven, we don't profess to have all the answers as to why this happened. But what we do know is that you are a God of love and mercy and grace. We know that you hear our prayers and as your children, we do pray to you now asking that you provide your comfort and peace in a way only you know how to give to the Johnson family and those grieving at this time. Although as humans, we don't ever really get over events such as these, we learn to live with the memories. So we are thankful, Father, for you bringing Carly into our sphere, into our lives, her bright and wide smile, her wit and her kindness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so this morning I want to spend a pocket of time exploring those themes from our New Testament daily reading in Matthew chapter 8. Those being God's power through Jesus' miracles displayed, healing and faith. We'll look at the man with leprosy that was healed, the healing of the centurion's servant, how faith plays a key role in God's plan for us, and finish off with some encouraging thoughts about God's grace towards us. So imagine, if you will, living with leprosy, a disease harshly affecting your skin, being considered by some a curse from God, Imagine being declared unclean and having to tear your clothes and put a covering on your upper lip and cry unclean, unclean when others are around. Imagine being despised in so much that your disease was contagious and so being ostracised from the community you grew up in. Imagine being left homeless and without the support structure of family and friends. Now imagine you hear of a man who has healed others and you wonder if he is willing to heal you, to give you a new lease on life. You make the decision to approach him as you walk down a mountainside amongst a large crowd. How will he ever find you? What do you say? How do you get his attention? As if by providence, a way is opened and you find your way to the man they call Jesus. You kneel before him in reverence and in clear violation of the Levitical law, heart racing. You look up and ask him if he is willing to make you clean. Time seems to stop as he looks you in the eyes. Anticipation is high. He reaches out his hand and touches you, also in defiance of Levitical law. He declares he is willing to heal you. Be clean. In that very instant, you are healed and your life changes forever. You're not just internally healed, but externally you are healed too. Your physical pain receptors are back, your tear ducts and sight that degraded a bit over time is back to normal. Praise God. You know, leprosy or Hansen's disease as it's sometimes referred to these days can be treated effectively with modern drug therapies and isolation is no longer normally necessary but it can't bring back noses, fingers and toes. So this truly was a miracle. Imagine the conversations this person then has with their family and friends that they reconnect with. How about us? Do we have a need of healing? In what way have we been healed so far? How can we incorporate the Halifax Street values of grow, connect and serve in our year ahead? How thankful are we for the healing we have received and will continue to receive through Jesus? Jesus' miracles in chapter 8 continue on with a centurion's servant lying paralysed and in great pain. The centurion had so much faith that he believed Jesus didn't even need to touch the servant or be in the same room as the servant for him to be healed. It is a matter of Jesus' will to heal. 
Say the word and my servant will be healed, the centurion said. Interestingly, in this example, it doesn't even seem to be about the person that is healed, but rather the faith of the leader of the centurion who approaches Jesus. Imagine the instant the servant is healed, the questions he and others around would have had about what happened. Imagine the conversations the centurion had with his servant and those around when he returned back to the house. How about us? Do we trust that we have been healed spiritually through Jesus' sacrifice in that we'll be raised from our slumber when our time of sleep arrives? We can say that Jesus is like the centurion who comes to the Father on our behalf and asks for our restoration. In fact, even though we are sometimes afar off, it doesn't separate us from the love of God. So what do these examples of healing have in common? Well, it seems that faith plays a key role. And Matthew chapter 17 speaks about a situation where the disciples could not heal a child with illness. And Jesus tells them it was due to their unbelief. I don't know about you, but I would have thought that the fact the disciples were hanging around Jesus meant that they were believers. After all, Jesus did so many miracles around them. However, I think this is a great example of showing us how the disciples are a bit like us, in that our preconceptions about the norms of life can often lead to disbelief. For example, it's not a physical norm of life that someone with missing parts of their face or limbs from leprosy can instantly be healed. And it's also not normal for someone to be able to walk on water, but it has been done and faith has been attributed to it. In Matthew 17, verse 20, Jesus said to his disciples, If you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. What did Jesus mean by this? Did he mean it literally, that if we have even the smallest amount of faith, we can move mountains? Or did he mean that if we really believe in something enough with God's help, we can make it so. The trouble is when we think about the size of faith, we end up assuming that if our prayers are not answered in the way we've asked, we don't have enough faith. We may read this passage and think that if we have or had even a small amount of faith, we could get what we pray for. The verse simply says though, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed. It could be talking about the measurement of faith, but suppose it's qualitative meaning to have the kind of faith as a mustard seed, as opposed to the size. As one author puts it, a mustard seed is one of the tiniest seeds around, but it grows rapidly into a large plant. Suppose we had faith that we could really believe in the far-reaching effects of our small efforts. Often we are cut short by thinking some version of, well, I'm just too small to matter. What difference can I make? This problem is too big for me. That is not the kind of faith that a mustard seed has. Its own size has nothing to do with the question. It is the seed of a mustard plant, and a mustard plant grows big. It will grow. That's its nature. So when we have the faith of a mustard seed, and rec we recognise our nature, we are then fully confident that we are made in the image of God, and therefore the powerful love of God can, does, and will continue to shine and grow through us. That's what the disciples forgot in the story of Matthew. They thought that because they were only human, they couldn't heal illness. But that wasn't their true nature. They were called for heavenly things. A mustard seed is very small, but has so much potential. So we've seen that faith is an enabler. It helps us remove obstacles and spurs action in various forms. Now let's look at how faith is built up and validated. 1 Peter 1 verse 7 tells the reader that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The word trial there literally means testing. So this testing through trials in our lives is more precious than gold. 
Gold was, and still is, very valuable, and it's, of course, a metal. It shines even when it's not pure. But if you mix gold with other metals, it still looks like pure gold. If you heat gold to very high temperatures and melt it in a pot, you find out whether the gold really is pure, as it gets hotter than any other of the metals and bits of dirt rise to the surface. Then someone can remove the impurities. This is a real process and is performed over and over again until only the genuine, pure gold is left. It's easier to live a Christian life when things are going well. But Christians often have troubles in their lives. God uses these troubles and trials to develop our faith. What if instead of thinking of faith as something we bottle up and keep so that when trials come we can get through them, we could think of faith as what is built up during trials. In Hebrews chapter 11, we read of the faithful of old who moved their mountains. We have examples of the righteous having the faith to overcome. Abel remained faithful despite the fact that his own brother did not like his righteous behaviour. In a world completely given over to sin, Noah remained faithful and saved his family. Like Noah, Abraham was asked to trust God concerning things he couldn't see. Even when it looked impossible, Sarah trusted God because of the promise he made to her. And Moses chose hardship and ple over pleasure and riches. And one of the most inspirational parts of this chapter comes in the last two verses, Hebrews 11, 39 to 40. And all, and these all, the faithful, having obtained a good report through faith, did not receive the promise, for God had provided some better thing for us, that they should not be made perfect without us. So it's not only a chapter of the past, but a chapter of the present and future, because all of us are included there too. Who here likes making reservations? When we go on holidays, we might reserve seats on an aeroplane. We might reserve a hotel room. We might make reservations at a busy restaurant. And the big one, time. We put aside and reserve the time to carry out the holiday. What if I was to tell you that God has already made a reservation for you and I? Peter reveals to us in 1 Peter 1 verses 3 and 4 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Wow, we've got an inheritance from above. The booking has already been made. Our names are written in God's book of life. And we read on in verse 5, it says there in verse 5 of 1 Peter 1, who are kept, that's us, by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So our reservation is being held by the power of God and is linked to our faith. Isn't that interesting? When you reserve something of value, a deposit is usually required. And here Peter is saying that our incorruptible inheritance is kept by the power of God through faith. Jesus is the one who has secured our inheritance. No one can take that away from us. And when he returns, it will be given to the faithful. This inheritance is not like anything in this world. Peter describes it in three ways. Incorruptible, undefiled and unfailing, unfading. So it will never wear out or get old, nothing can destroy it. It won't spoil or go bad. It won't lose its beauty. It's not like a metal that stops shining or like a light that goes out. Our inheritance is always protected because of our trust in God. The word kept there in verse five has the idea of a military stronghold, so it's guarded. And it's the same word used in Philippians 4 verse 7 where it says, And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep 
your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. In this example, God's peace acts as the guard to keep our hearts and minds with Jesus. So we can't help then but to have confidence in our God through Christ. Second of Corinthians 3, verses 4 to 6. Second of Corinthians 3, verses 4 to 6. They say, Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Isn't that just an amazingly positive and encouraging thought? We can have confidence in God through Jesus. God provides our sufficiency to be part of the new covenant, which is not of words, but of the Spirit and his grace. In, in John 1, verse 16, there's an interesting phrase used. John 1, verse 16 says, For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. What does that mean? The word upon there means in place of. So, for from his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace. And Abby and I were at the beach recently and as we watched the water we could see one wave coming in and before it's even broken, sure enough, right behind it there's another wave. Endlessly, this keeps on going. God's grace is like this. As the verse says, grace in place of grace. It keeps being given. What a wonderful God we have and what a gracious God we have who has been gracious with believers throughout time. God provided manna every morning for his people as they wandered in the desert, even though their behaviour wasn't perfect. And in Lamentations 3 verse 22 we read that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God is faithful in keeping his promises to us. Friends, it's quite clear that we have a certain hope in the risen Christ, soon to set, set foot once again on this earth. As we come together at the start of a new year, let us remember him, his perfect walk, his purity, his strength, but most of all the sacrifice he made for us. In 2019, God be with us as we keep growing, connecting and serving while we wait for Jesus' return. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God.